Welcome to the History of Computing podcast, where we explore the history of information technology. Because understanding the past prepares us to innovate and sometimes cope with the future. Today, we're going to talk about a game that introduced many, or at least many about my age, to the world of gaming, the Oregon Trail. Now, the original Oregon Trail is a 2100 plus mile wagon route that stretched from the Missouri River to settleable lands in Oregon. Along the way, it cuts through Kansas, Nebraska, Wyoming, and Idaho. After parts were charted by Lewis and Clark from 1804 to 1806, it was begun by fur traders in 1811. But by the 1830s, Americans began to journey across the trail to settle the wild lands of the Pacific Northwest. And today, Interstates 80 and 84 follow parts of it. But the game is about the grueling journey that people made from 1824 and on, which saw streams of wagons flow over the route in the 1840s. And over the next hundred years, it became a thing talked about in textbooks, a thing of lore but difficult to relate to in a land of increasing abundance. So flash forward to 1971. America is a very different place than those wagon loads of humans would have encountered or even noticed back in the days of Fort Boise or on the Bozeman Trail, both of which have large cities named after them at this point. Instead, in 1971, NPR produced their first broadcast. Amtrak was created in the U.S. Greenpeace was founded. Fred Smith created Federal Express. A Clockwork Orange was released. And Dan Raywich wrote The Oregon Trail while he was a senior at Carleton College to help teach an 8th grade history class in Northfield, Minnesota about the Oregon Trail. It's probably hard to imagine these days but the game was cutting edge at the time. Another event in 1971, the introduction of the Intel 4004 processor comes along, which changed everything in computing in just 10 short years. In 1971, when Apollo 14 landed on the moon, the computer was made of handcrafted coils and chips and a tin keypad was used to punch in code. When Ray Tomlinson invented email that year, computers weren't really interactive. When IBM invented the floppy disk that same year, no one would have guessed they would someday be used to give school children dysentery across the world. But not dysentery for reals. When he first wrote Organ, as the game was originally known, Don was using a time-shared HP 2100 computer at Pillsbury. Yes, the Pillsbury of Doughboy fame, which makes all those lovely flaky biscuits and the the container that they come in, the pops. The HP was running timesharing basic, and Don roped in his roommates, Paul Dillenberger and Bill Heinemann, to help out. Back then, the computer wrote output to teletype and took data in using tape terminals, paper tape terminals. But the kids loved it anyways. They would take a wagon from Independence, Missouri to Willamette Valley, Oregon, making a grueling journey in a covered wagon in 1848. And they might die of dysentery, starvation, mountain fever, broken legs, or other ailments which Raywich could think of. Gaming on paper tape was awkward, but the kids were inspired. They learned about computers and the history of how the West was settled at the same time. When the class was over, Don printed the code for the game, probably not thinking much would happen with it after that. But then he got hired by the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium, or MEC, in 1974. Back in the 60s and 70s, Minnesota had been a huge hub of computing. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves all had offices in the state and early pioneers of mainframes like Honeywell, Unisys, ERA, and so Control Data and Crave from there, and IBM all did a lot of work in the state. And there were big companies that they sold into. The state had funded MEC to build educational software for classrooms following the successes at TIES, or the Total Information for Educational Systems, 
which had brought a time-sharing service on an HP 2000 along with training and software. And they still do that service for Minnesota schools. From there, the state created Mech to create software for schools. And Don, who had just gotten a job there, dug up that code from 1971 and typed it back into the time-sharing computers at Mech. He tweaked it a little to make it available on the CDC Cyber 70 they were using, and before you knew it, thousands of people were playing his game. By 1978, he published the source code in Creative Computing Magazine as the Oregon Trail. And then J.P. O'Malley would modify the basic programming to run on an Apple II, and the Apple Puget Sound Program Library Exchange would post the game on their user group, making it available for thousands more people. The Oregon Trail 2 would come along that year as well, and by 1980, Mech would release it along with better graphics as a part of an elementary series on educational titles. But the graphics got better with a full release as a standalone game in 1985. Along the way, it had gotten ported for the Atari in 1983 and the Commodore 64 in 1984. But that 1985 version was the one we played at my school. We loved getting to play on the computers in school. The teachers seemed to mostly love getting a break from us as we were all silent while playing, at least until we lost one of our party, and then we'd laugh and squeal at the same time. We'd buy oxen, an extra yoke for our wagon, food, bullets, and then we'd set off on our journey to places many of us had never heard of. We'd get diseases, break limbs, get robbed, and watch early versions of cutscenes in 8-bit graphics. And along the way, we learned. We learned about a city called Independence, Missouri, and that life was very different in 1848. We learned about history. We learned about game mechanics. We started the game with $800. We learned about bartering and how carpenters were better at fixing wagon wheels than bankers were. We tried to keep our party alive, and we learned that it's a good idea to save a little money to ferry across rivers. We learned the rudimentaries of shooting games as we tried to kill a bear here and there. We learned that rabbits don't give us much meat. We learned to type bang and wham fast so we could shoot animals. And later, we learned to aim with arrow keys and fire with a space bar. The bison moved slow and gave plenty of meat, at least more than the hundred pounds you could carry back to your wagon. So we shot them, a lot of them, just like the settlers did. We learned carpenters could fix wheels and to conserve enough money to ferry your wagon so you didn't sink or have one of your party drown. We learned that you got double the points for playing the carpenter and triple for playing the farmer. We wanted to keep our family alive, not only because we got to name them, often making fun of our friends in the process, but also because they gave us more points that way, as did the possessions we were able to hang on to at the end of the game. By 1990, with a changing tide, the game came to DOS, and by 1991 it was ported to the Mac. Mouse support was added in 1992, and it came to Windows in 1993, or at least Windows 3. SoftKey released the Oregon Trail Classic Edition, and by 1995 the Oregon Trail made up a third of the Mech budget, raking in over $30 million a year and helping to fund other educational titles. Oregon Trail 2, or at least the real Oregon Trail 2, came in 95, 3 in 97, 4 in 99, and 5 made it into the new millennium in 2001. And 10 years later, it made it to the modern era of console gaming, showing up for the Wii and 3DS. And today, you can learn all of what we learned by playing the game on archive.org. I'll include a link in the show notes. The Internet Archive page shows the 1990 version that was ported and made available to the Apple II, Macintosh, Windows, and DOS. The Internet Archive page alone has nearly 7.2 million views, but the game itself has actually sold over 65 million copies, making it one of the most popular games of all time. The Oregon Trail is beloved by many. 
I see shirts with You Have Died of Dysentery and card versions of the game in stores. I've played it in Facebook games and mobile versions as well. It's even been turned into plays and parodied in TV shows. That wagon is one of the better known symbols of all time in gaming lore, and we still use many of the same gaming mechanics introduced then, in games from Dragon Warrior for the Nintendo NES to the trading and inventory systems that were inspired by it that are present in World of Warcraft and many other games. We can thank the Oregon Trail for giving our teachers a break from teaching us in school and maybe saving our lives in that regard, and giving us a break from learning, although I suspect we learn plenty from the game. And we can thank MEC for continuing the fine tradition of computer sciences in Minnesota. And we can thank Don for inspiring millions, many of which went on to create their own games. And we can thank you, dear listener, for tuning in to this episode, yet another episode, of the History of Computing podcast. We are so, so, so lucky to have you. Have a great day. And keep in mind, a steady pace will get you to the end of the trail before the snows come, with plenty of time to take ferries across the rivers. So rest when you need it. And no, you probably aren't likely to beat my high score. Have a great day.